Acts chapter 14. I'm going to begin reading at verse 19. And here's what it says. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and warned the crowds over to their side. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up, went back to the city, uh-oh, and the next day he and Barnabas left for Derby. I want to read this one part again that really blessed me. It says, but when the disciples had gathered around him, he got up. You may be seated in the presence of God. He got up. Father, you blessed us to come into this place. I ask that you would speak to us during our time together. God, we didn't come to, to see a person. We came to encounter the Savior. And Father, we believe that as we open up our hearts that you're going to speak to us in a meaningful way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody who believed it, say it. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Ty. I want to I begin this, this series of, of sermons entitled Group Chat. We'll be here in this vein for the next four to six weeks. I want to challenge you uh, not to miss a single moment of this series. Why? Because I believe uh, that this series has the power to radically transform your life. I believe it has the power to radically transform your life. This series, Group Chat. As I was preparing for our time together today, I couldn't help but think, I am in so many group chats. <laughs> Anybody else just group chat out? Like if y'all add me to one more group chat, I am going to lose my mind. So sometimes it just feels like non-stop notifications. I mean, have you ever had to mute a group chat? <laughs> it's like, it is 11.30 at night. What are, are y'all so excited to talk to each other for? Uh-oh, have you ever been added to a group chat that you didn't ask to be put in? <laughs> I'm just offended, like why am I here? I don't even know these people. Here's the truth. That the conversation in a group chat is determined by the composition of the group. That what we talk about in the group is determined by who is actually in that group. And why is this such a big deal? Because because I'm only comfortable talking about certain things around certain people. Like you ever had people add somebody new to the group chat and then you got to go make a new group chat on the side with the old people from the original group chat to ask them who, did, who just got added? <laughs> like I'll just be adding people all willy-nilly to the group chat. So now I got to make a group chat on the side and be like, all right, who is this 613 number? <laughs> Why? Because I'm only comfortable having certain conversations around certain people. Hmm. B -b because life has taught me that I can't talk about everything with everybody. Y'all don't, don't hear me. C come here, come here, Joseph, who Joseph has a dream from God. He gets so excited about it that he decides to share it with his brothers, not understanding that his brothers were undercover haters. And instead of them celebrating what God was getting ready to do in his life, they grab him, throw him in the pit. Why? Because you can't talk about everything with everybody. And what, are, what is one of the ideas that I want to introduce to you during our time together is that you've got to become more measured with who you have certain conversations with. Because you're wondering why half of Nashville knows your business. And can I tell you, the truth of the matter is you told them. Because you didn't tell everybody, but is it possible that you told the wrong somebody? <laughs> there's all types of, of, of group chats. You've got 
work group chats. Those are a little irritating. And in the work group chat, what do we talk about? Work. <laughs> You've got your family group chat. And in that group chat, what do you talk about? But my favorite type of group chat is my friend group chat. Because in my work group chat, we talk about work. In my family group chat, we talk about family. But in my friend group chat, we talk about everything. And if it's the right day, everybody. <laughs> you ever been somewhere with other people that were in your group chat and y'all were talking about other people who were there in the group chat? I gotta pray for my church, y'all messy. <laughs> I want to suggest to you as we begin this, this series of sermons that, that a group chat should not just be a place of entertainment. It should also be a place of improvement. It shouldn't just be a place where we share memes. It should also be a place of shared mission. It shouldn't just be a place where we plan brunch. It should also be a place where we plan a business. It shouldn't just be a place where we play. It should also be a place where we pray. It shouldn't just be a place where I can be my, myself. It should also be a place where I can become my best self. It shouldn't just be a place where we joke. It should be a place where we push each other to become everything that God is calling us to be. Because the right community allows you to have real conversations. And perhaps this is why the Bible talks about friendship so much. Because group chats aren't just a good idea. I want to suggest they're a God idea. This is why the Bible says in Proverbs 13 and 20, I'm already teaching, walk with the wise and become wise for a companion of fools suffers harm. Hmm. Proverbs is promising us that the quality of your life will be a reflection of the quality of people that are in your life. That's not on the screens, but I need you to put that in your notes. What is he telling us, this proverbial writer? He's promising us that the quality of our life will often be a reflection of the quality of people that are in your life. Why? Because you're always becoming like whoever you walk with. Hmm, did you hear what I just said? You're always becoming like whoever you walk with. Here's a question that I want you to answer over the course of the next week. If you're always becoming like who you are walking with, here's a question. Who are you becoming? Ba based upon the other couples that y'all are friends with, where is your relationship headed? Because all your friends are in this struggle, love, toxic relationship thing that we think is cute. Oh, y'all didn't like that. Uh-oh, yeah. It's tight, but it's right. Based upon who you're walking with, are you becoming a better husband or a worse one? Based upon who you're walking with, are you moving closer to that degree? Or are you actually getting further from it? I, I remember years ago when, when all my, my line brothers, y'all know I, I pledged the greatest fraternity uh, on the face of this earth, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. I remember a few years ago, all of my frat brothers were buying houses. And that's all they were talking about in the group chat was interest rates and down payments and, and appraisals and all this other stuff. And, and I'm, I'm sitting there living it, sitting in my apartment <laughs> with my wife saying, Girl, we got to buy us a house. We gotta, I got I to do better. Why? Because who I was around gave me an appetite that I didn't already have. And see, here's why I'm so glad you're not jealous. Because because you're not jealous, when you see other people around you doing good, you don't get mad. You get motivated. 
See, this is why I don't need jealous people around me because I don't need you to see me walking in what God has called me to walk in and get mad. No, instead, I need you to see me becoming who and what God has called me to be and that you get motivated and say, if God is doing that in their life, then God can do the same thing in my life. Am I preaching to anybody in the room who can say, Pastor Hollis, that's not a jealous bone in my body. I want everybody, I want everybody around me and connected to me to become everything that God has called them to be. And when I see God do it in their life, it's going to make me stand up and realize that he can do the same thing in my life. Because a group chat is not just a good idea. A group chat is also a God idea. Did you catch that? <laughs> here it is, here it is, here it is, here it is. And I really want you to grab this. I really want you to grab this. Mm. Wow. Proverbs is promising us that the quality of our life is often going to be a reflection of the quality of people that are in your life. Because you will become like whoever you walk with. I learned this a few years ago, and I want to teach this to you. There are three types of poverty. Three types of poverty. Are y'all ready for this? I need you to put this in your notes. Three types of poverty. Take really, really good notes today, okay? Three types of poverty. Number one is material poverty. Material poverty. This is when you have a possession deficit. Hmm, a possession deficit. In other words, Pastor Hollis, I don't have enough. I've got more going out than I have coming in. I don't have enough. Ends aren't meeting. You got me? This is what we call material poverty. Okay? But then number two, there's what we call spiritual poverty. Spiritual poverty. This is not when you have a possession deficit. This is when you have a prayer deficit. So you don't pray enough. So you're, you're, you're in spiritual poverty. Why? Because you're settling for a level less than what God has for you. All right. But then number three is what you call relational poverty. This is so good. This is not when you have a possession deficit or a prayer deficit. This is when you have a people deficit. So material poverty says I don't have enough. Spiritual poverty says I don't pray enough. Relational poverty says I don't connect enough. Mm. Because we live in the most disconnected, connected time of, of all history, in all history. Can I say that again? We live in the most connected yet disconnected time in all of history. Because truth be told, you can pick up your phone right now and communicate with people on the other side of the world. But sometimes you struggle to communicate with people who are on the other side of the bed. I said what I said. And I meant it. I'm standing on business today. So you, so you can connect to somebody across town, but you cannot connect to the people across the hall. Because we live in the most connected yet disconnected time in all of history. Because Facebook made you think that because somebody press a button that they're your actual friend. Like it hit me, to, it hit me a few years ago. I, I posted, I made this post on Facebook. And you know your boy be going viral and whatnot. <laughs> you know. I'm, I ain't listen. It ain't fair, but it's on me. I'm sorry. <laughs> and it hit me because I, I used to put a lot of like, like really a lot of like emphasis on the fact that like I could post something and a lot of people would like it or engage with it. Like I thought that was real influence. Like I'm sorry y'all, social media influence is not real influence. Like 26,000 people follow me on Instagram. Where they at? <laughs> because you're here and you don't even follow me on Instagram. I made a post once, and it, and it was it was crazy. It got like thousands of likes, and I was sitting there getting ready to brag about how many likes it got, and then the Holy Spirit told me it was like three thousand likes, right? 
And so the Holy Spirit was like, you don't even know 3,000 people. So, so you think that because they, they're liking your post that they like you. Y'all okay? That's, that's not real influence. Why? Because I don't even know those people. They just know the me that they saw on social media. And sometimes that's the real me. And then sometimes when I roll over in the middle of the night with some little crust in my eye and midnight breath, they wouldn't like that me. Oh. And if we're not careful, we'll fall into this trap of thinking that because we're connected digitally, then that means that we're actually connected physically. Oh, man, this is so good. All right. And is it possible that you've been trying to live a good life with bad friends? Mm. Say amen or say ouch when I teach. It's the exact same thing. Is it possible that you've been trying to live a good life with bad friends? Because it's one thing to have the right plan for your life. It's another thing to have the right partners in your life. And if you're going to become everything that God has called you to be, you don't just need the right plan. You also need the right partners. You need the right partners. It's great that you've got a plan, but what's a plan with no partners? All right. Uh-oh. Here it is. This is on the screen. Because this is the difference between being surrounded and being supported. Hmm. Hollis Thomas Sr. Say that again. That's the difference between being surrounded and being supported. Because when you're surrounded, that means you've got a whole lot of people around you but when you're supported that means you actually got a lot of people who are with you and I've lived long enough to realize that everybody who's with me isn't actually with me which is why in this season of my life I don't need you just to talk about it I need you to actually show me with your actions that you actually got my back why because there's too much that I'm believing God for for me to allow myself to continue to be connected to people who talk the good game but they're not really the actual actually be what God has called me to be. Can I find somebody in the room today who's gotten too old to play games with people? We ain't got to be friends. We, not, we don't have to act like we like each other. In fact, may the Lord watch between me and thee while we're absent one from another. Why? Because in this season of my life, I need people who are really going to hold me down and not hold me back. I need people who have my best interests in mind. Somebody should shout amen. amen. That's the difference between being surrounded and then actually being supported. In fact, here's a public service announcement to all my strong people. You know, you're the strong friend. And everybody think that because you're so strong, you never need anything and you never need no support. And yes, I hardly ever do. But there's always one moment when I need somebody to stand up and be there for me the same way I was there for them. I'm tired of being surrounded without being supported. I need people in my life who can say you had my back when I needed you. Now let me step in and hold you down I don't want to just be surrounded. I want to be supported. That's so good. I don't want to just be, you, matter of fact, you need to pull out your phone and you need to start texting people and ask them, are you, are, are you just around? Because I got enough people who are just around. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I got enough people who are just hanging around. Like what I'm trying to become and what I'm trying to do and the generational cycles that I'm trying to break. I don't just need somebody that's around. We spend enough time just being around. I need to know if you actually are in agreement. I need to know if you're actually in agreement with what God is trying to do in my life. This is why one of our core values here at One City is we are one. We are one. Pastor Hollis, what does that mean? This means that we believe that when we come together, things come together. When we come together, 
things come together. This is why I was celebrating with you guys the fact that we were able to make a dream come true for three students right here in this very high school because when we come together, things come together. This is why we celebrated just a few moments ago that 44 people went public with their faith last week because when we come together, things come together. This is why I stand on stage and tell you to the dollar how much money we've given away since we've become a church. Why? Because when we come together, things come together. And can I tell you what the devil doesn't want to see? He doesn't want to see people come to together. Why? Because the Bible says wherever two or three gather together in my name, touching and agreeing, then I'll be in the midst. And I don't know what you came in here needing from God, but I dare you to grab your neighbor's hand and look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm going to believe God for you. You believe God for me. And when we start touching and agreeing, God promised that he'll come in the midst. Look at somebody, tell them, I got your back. I got your back. Look at somebody else, tell them, I got your back. I got your back. You don't even know you looking at the way I dress and you don't even know you sat next to a prayer warrior. Because when I start praying, stuff starts happening. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to start speaking some stuff over your neighbor. God, my neighbor is blessed. My neighbor is covered. My neighbor is anointed. My neighbor's walking in purpose. Why are you sitting there not speaking over your neighbor? Speak that no weapon formed against them will ever be able to prosper. Speak that they're blessed when they come and blessed when they go. Because when we come together, things come together. When we come together, things come together. When we come together, hey, things come together. Yeah, when we come together, things come together. Y'all silly, y'all so Because the enemy may not be afraid of you, but he is afraid of us. I don't know who to preach to. Did you hear what I said? He may not be afraid of you, but he is afraid of us. This is why you cannot afford to play games with who you're connected to. All right. Because every God given dream requires a God given team. And in our text today, I believe we see the power of community and friendship. Pastor Alice, I got, I got, I got 10 minutes. I got to get you out. But Paul and Barnabas are new in town. All right. And, and, and they're, 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 they're these new young guys in town preaching like crazy. You get it? You see where we're going with this? Young, fly, I mean, put it on. I mean, very, very well dressed, Aaron. I mean, just got it on. Young guys in town, man, preaching, people coming, folks getting saved. I mean, it's crazy. I think like last week they baptized like 40-something people. It's <laughs> talking about Paul and Barnabas, y'all. They're preaching. Everything's going crazy. And, and the Bible says, this is so good. The Bible says that they encounter a man who's lame, he can't walk, and by the power of God, they heal him. And when the people see it, they start worshiping Paul and Barnabas. They thought they were gods. You don't believe me? Look at the text, verse 15. It says, friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from those worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. They see what Paul and Barnabas are doing, and they think that because they're doing it, they're actually the ones doing it. And so they look at them and say, don't give me the credit for this. This was nothing but God. And, and maybe you don't see it yet, but I'm in the text and you're in the text because the people around you are looking at where you are in life and how good things are going and maybe what you drive or maybe the amount of peace you have or maybe what you survive and they think it's you. But God needs you to look back at them and tell them it wasn't nothing but God. Who am I preaching to today? Who can say, you just don't know me. I was torn up 
from the floor up, but it was God who got me out of that. It was God who pulled me up and, and picked me up and, and turned me around. Don't give me the credit for something that only God can do. Can you take 15 seconds and can you praise God? Because he did this. I don't look like what I've been through because he did. This. I survived some stuff that should have took my life because God did this. Is there anybody in the house who's not afraid to praise God because he does things that seem impossible? What is Paul and Barnabas teaching us is that God is looking for people who will give him the glory, not rob him of the glory. We are called to reflect God's glory, not rob him of the glory. And is it possible that there's some things that God hasn't been able to do in your life yet because you haven't learned to get the good but give the glory to God? Did you hear what I just said? Maybe there's some promotion that's on pause in your life because you haven't learned how to get the good but give the glory to God. Can I tell you what our problem is oftentimes? Oftentimes our problem is that we want the good and the glory. We want the promotion and the praise. We haven't learned that, that whenever, the, whenever God does something in your life, he's always doing it for your good but for his glory. This is so good. All right, I, I got to hurry. Look at verse 19. Then some Jews arrived from Antioch and Iconium and warned the crowds to their side. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of town thinking he was dead. Yeah. Jesus Christ. All right. So some people from Paul's past show up in Paul's present. Th this is good. See, see, the Bible to me is like a movie. So I see Paul and Barnabas and they doing their thing and they, they, they worship him and, 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 and they're preaching and everything's going crazy. And it's like this cool movie. And then some people walk in out of nowhere. Some haters. They show up and they like, why y'all doing all of this for Paul and Barnabas? And the Bible says that when somebody, when the old crowd shows up. Mm, this is good. That word crowd bothered me when I looked at my notes because is it possible that there are some things in life that you can't overcome because your life has gotten overcrowded? Is it possible that there are some things that you can't overcome because you've allowed your life to become overcrowded? Pastor Hollis, what does that mean? You got people in your life who truth be told don't need to be there. See, here's, here's, something we got, we, here's something we got to get rid of. We got to get rid of this idea where people like guilt trip you into like outgrowing them. No, no, we're not doing that. That's your fault, not mine. If you allow me to outgrow you, then oh well. What, do you, what did you want me to do? You wanted me to stop growing? So that we can stay together? No, I'm not doing that. I tried that in one season. It didn't work. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to keep growing. Now, because I love you, I'm going to do everything I can to help you grow too. But ultimately, your growth is your responsibility, not mine. No, I love you. We cool. I'm not being bougie or stuck up. It's just I kept growing and you didn't. You want me to slow down? No, look at, look at you. Look at what you do sometimes in life. You, you are, you are self-sabotaging your success. To stay connected to people who don't even want the things out of life that you want. Because cause here's the thing. You're the one who's going to be miserable on that level because they like it. Because if they didn't, they would be trying to grow too. And maybe there's some things you can't overcome because your life has become overcrowded. It's too many people in your room. It's too many people in your life. There's a story in the Bible where Jesus gets ready to raise a girl back from the dead. And the Bible says that when he gets to the house, he puts everybody out. Be because Jesus was saying, I don't, I don't even want to do this in front of them. 
Jesus Christ. And sometimes you've got to self-assess your circle and realize, are you a liability or an asset? Because there's some stuff that maybe God can't do in my life until I get rid of people who don't even need to be there in the first place. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but I'm giving you a spiritual license to start evicting people out of your circle who have been stuck and stagnant and complacent for far too long. This is so good. This is so good. The crowd shows up and wins people over to their side. This is what one social researcher, uh, Brene Brown, calls common enemy intimacy. Mm. Social re researcher Brene Brown, she's ca she calls it common enemy intimacy. Common enemy intimacy, what's that, Pastor Hollis? It's a cheap form of connection where two or more people bond over what they hate instead of what they love. Did you hear what I just said? I, I just broke up like 5,500 friendships right now. Because sometimes you gotta go back to the origin of that friendship. Like did we bond over our shared dysfunction? Because here's the problem with that. When you get delivered and they don't, you got to return back to dysfunction in order to stay connected to them. And then you wonder why your life looks like a big cycle and a big circle because you love them so much that you hate your own deliverance. Yes, I said it and I meant it. I'm standing on business today. Why? Because I love you too much to allow you to stay stuck in something that God has already called you out of. Common enemy intimacy. Uh-oh. See, this is crazy. Because the same way that God will use community to build you up, the enemy will use community to tear you down. See, the devil does not have creative capabilities. So he cannot create anything. He just perverts what's already been created. He cannot create anything. Listen to me. I'm going to tell you that Negro tricks. He cannot create anything. Okay? All he can do is pervert what's already been created. So God uses community to build you up. So the enemy will turn around and try to use the same thing that God intended to build you up to tear you down. So in life, you've got two type of relationships. You've got the relationships that elevate you. And then you've got the relationships that will bring you back down. Which one are you choosing? Or, or maybe like me, you go through seasons where you feel stuck in between both. So you got the friends that bring you down here. And then you got the friends who get you up here. But you grew up with these friends. So, you know, every once in a while I just go kick it and hang out. But, you know, I'm really, I'm really trying to be around these people. And this is what your life looks like. You getting all your cardio in. Because you just, you up sometimes and then you down sometimes. Because I got, I don't want them to think I'm being bougie or that I try, but I got to get to the next level. But oh, now they miss me. So I got to go back around. Oh, but then now my bill's behind, so I got to get back serious. But then they, oh, you changed since you got that degree. But now I'm trying to do better. And your life keeps going up, down, up, down, up, down. Aren't you tired of being inconsistent in life? When all you got to do is trust God to realize that if God gave you the dream, then God will give you the team. I'm going to give you 15 seconds to praise God. Common enemy intimacy. It's when you can only relate to people through negativity. And so your relationships are cynical by nature. It's negative. 
So y'all in that group chat and all y'all do is talk about people. That's it. It's not uplifting at all. By, by the time you get done talking to them, you feel worse than you did in the beginning. <laughs> Here's the problem. The, the Bible says the crowd showed up. Because when you live for the approval of the crowd, eventually you'll compromise in order to get it. I'm not winning. I'm not living life for the approval of the crowd. Because eventually I'll start compromising. What, 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 what do you compromise, Pastor Hollis? You compromise your calling. You compromise your values. You compromise who you actually are. Have you ever looked at something you did and you was like, that's not even me. Compromise. I got, I'm, I got to hurry. I'm, I'm holding you too long. Here it is. We're done. And the Bible says, she said, take your time. The Bible says that they stone Paul, drag him out the city, thinking he was dead. Hmm, I'm going to come back and get that think. But as the believers gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. And the next day he left with Barnabas for Derby. Here's three things that you need to ask for in your friendships. All right. I forgot to tell you my sermon topic. Today I came to preach, I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> I'm asking for a friend. Here's three things you need to ask for in your friendships. Y'all ready? Number one, three questions you need to ask. Here's the first one. Are they even close enough to be called a friend? I'm, I'm walking heavy today. I think it's the Air Force Ones. When you break, when you break out that crispy pair, these fresh out the box. I, this first time, this their first trip, first day out. Number one, you need to ask yourself, yeah, play, because you don't know how I keep preaching. Ask yourself, are they, are they even close enough to be called a friend? Because church, can I tell you the truth? And don't get mad at me, I love you. It's a very good chance that you're calling people a friend who actually aren't. Mm. Verse, verse 20 says that the disciples gathered around him. All right? Are they close enough to even be called a friend? Because when, when Paul was in trouble, the right people gathered around him. They got closer to him. See, see, when you go through stuff, do the people you call friend get further away or do they come closer? Don't just tell me that you're, you're when, I, when I'm on and everything's going well, you're, you're right up there next to me. When I go through a tough time, you just, you just fall off, you drop off. Are they close enough? to even be called a friend. This is about intimacy. It's about intimacy. Intimacy. And many of us are suffering from mislabeled relationships. Because truth be told, there's no intimacy in that friendship. Y'all don't know each other well. Y'all don't know each other well enough to call them friends. And I know they were a coworker and a coworker you actually liked and that's okay. Hey, I'm going to lunch with my friend. Hey, I'm going to lunch with my coworker. Because when you say the words, you start expecting the action. And then when they're actually friend, and then when their actual friend gets hired at the company and they start going to lunch with them instead of lunch with you, now you're mad. That wasn't your friend. That was your coworker. This is about intimacy. Number two. Second question you need to ask, when you're around them, does it pick you up or does it pull you down? Because verse 20 says that Paul got up. When, when you're around them, does it, 
drag your spirit down or does it pick your spirit up? Do you feel encouraged or discouraged? When the crowd came, they knocked him down. When the core came, they picked him up. Number three, third question you need to ask. Do they help you face the things that you need to face? So, so number one is about intimacy. Number two is about influence. Do they pick you up or pull you down? Number three, do they help you face the things you need to face? Because verse 20 says that Paul gets up and goes right back into the city and starts preaching again. Now, Paul, brother, you crazy. These folks just stoned you. They just drug you out the city. They just molly you. They shot the kegs under you. Paul, you got beat down for preaching. And you mean to tell me you're going to go right back to preaching in the same city? Because when the right people got around him, they helped him face the things that he needed to face. This is about inspiration. I never forget <laughs> my, my freshman year of high school. My mom's here today. She probably don't even know this story. I'm about to get in trouble. Can I get a whooping at 30? Am I too old for a whooping? Yeah. Have I aged out of, of whoopings? My freshman year of high school, they used to do something called Fresh Meat Friday. Anybody, y'all know about Fresh Meat Friday? It's an Alabama thing, okay. Fresh Meat Friday, <laughs> all the freshman athletes would take turns basically getting beat up. And I remember on my whole freshman year, I was, I was trying to play basketball, so I was, I was with, with the basketball players, and, and I was, every Friday I would just be so afraid because I just didn't know if it was my Friday to be fresh meat. <laughs> every Friday I'd be terrified. And, and I remember as the year go, going on, they got to my, my friend Fernando. It was fresh meat, y'all. Got to my friend Myron, we called him Binky. He was fresh meat. Got to my friend Jeremy. He was, he was fresh meat. Just, just fr Friday after Friday. It's just, and I know it's only a matter. It's only so many Fridays. It's only a matter of time before they get to me. And the last Friday of the semester, I knew it was my turn. So the bell rung and I did what anybody with good sense would do. I sat at my desk and I didn't move. Cause I knew if I stepped out of that hallway, they're gonna be waiting for me. School got out at three. It was probably like 3.45 by now. And eventually I, I'm saying, you know what, I gotta, I gotta go, I gotta, I gotta get home. And I get up, I grab my book bag, I walk out, and I see all the guys waiting at the end of the hallway. But by now I've committed to it. So you know what? I just, I got as brave as I could. And I said, you know what? I'm going to stand on business. If I get beat up, I just get, oh well, it is what it is. And I remember getting to this hallway right before where the rest of the guys were. And waiting in that hallway was my older sister, Haley. And I looked up and y'all, I had never been more happy to see her in my life. Girl, come here, girl, I love you. And she said, she looked at me and she said, I knew that today was going to be the day that they were going to try to get you. 
And I stayed here until you came out of your classroom because I know why they don't know you, they do know me. Because you're a freshman, but I'm a sophomore and I've been through this before. And so I know what to do and I know what to tell you. And I know if I walk with you through this hallway, even though they would have messed with you when you were on your own, they're not going to mess with you because you're with me. And what did I come to tell you? That you need the right people in your life because the devil will mess with you when you're on your own. But when you're with the right people, you can walk. David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. Why? Because you're walking with me. And so I walked through that hallway with my head held high because there was a different confidence that overcame me when I knew that I didn't have to face it on my own. And can I tell you something, family? Yes, I want you to have friends here on earth, but can I tell you something? That 2,000 years ago, a man named Jesus paid the ultimate price so that he could be called your friend. Oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. We got a friend named Jesus.